Some portions of this video deal with topics that may be too disturbing for certain viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. The internet is quite a disturbing place, but beyond just troll posts and creepypastas, there can be some genuinely horrible things that have taken place for the entire World Wide Web to see. Today, we're going to dive into a select few, so sit back, relax, and make sure your doors are locked. This case is fairly recent, as it took place in December of 2020. A Russian YouTuber by the name of Stas Rifle, real name Stanislav Reshetnyak, initially started his career by focusing on gameplay. But seeing as there are so many gaming channels out there, he found it difficult to compete. So he turned to some questionable live streams. He began doing cruel pranks and stunts on his streams, accepting donations for doing so. This type of streaming, called trash streaming, is not really allowed on YouTube, so he sometimes streamed on other sites that would let him do so. Once, he forced his friend to drink oil. Another time, the 30-year-old pepper sprayed his 28-year-old girlfriend, Valentina. But on the night of December 2nd, things would take a turn for the worse. One viewer pledged $1,000 for Staz to beat his girlfriend and then lock her outside. But... This was Moscow, and it was December. Temperatures were below freezing. Staz obliged, beating Valentina and then locking her outside on their balcony while she was just in her underwear. Sometime later, she was freezing cold and unresponsive. He dragged her inside, telling the viewers that she was pale and had no pulse. Medics, who arrived shortly after and told him to stop streaming, but he didn't. I'll play a clip of the stream for you here. Please be warned, it is rather disturbing. Самая лучшая подруга. Я умру вместе с тобой. Я поверю. Valentina's official cause of death was ruled as craniocerebral trauma, meaning extreme head injuries. Making matters worse, Valentina was pregnant at the time of her death. 
On April 27, 2021, Staz was convicted of involuntary manslaughter and sentenced to six years in a maximum security prison. Despite his actions, Staz still referred to Valentina as his best friend. A translated quote from him reads, Valia was my best friend, very kind and loyal. She was so talented. On my streams, they called her genius. She was an actress who graduated with honors. She truly wanted a real relationship, but I couldn't be with her, you see. She was a prostitute. I didn't want a relationship with a girl like that. He'll likely try to appeal his conviction, but as of now, he remains behind bars. Yet the disturbing trend of trash streaming continues. has been around on the internet for quite some time, but it is still one of the most disturbing videos I have ever seen. In 2014, a cell phone was left in a taxi in Fiji. A troubling video was found on it, which was then uploaded onto the internet. This is part of that video. An absolute massacre takes place over the course of the nearly seven minute long video. It appears that there is wreckage from an overturned wooden boat and that the men floating in the water were its previous occupants. One by one, they are sadistically picked off by crew members who laugh and take selfies while doing so. At least 40 rounds are fired off and then blood can be seen shining through the rough blue waters. What makes the situation regarding this video even worse is that no one in the video has ever been identified. None of the dead men's bodies have washed up anywhere, as this boat was likely far out in the middle of the ocean. None of the boat's crew or the owner of the phone that the video was originally found on have been identified either. No one is able to figure out where this video was recorded either, meaning no country's government can really step forward and take charge in the case. Officials from Taiwan connected one of the four fishing boats seen in the video to a fishing boat in Taiwan, but they learned little from the ship's captain. They believed that the men in the water were failed pirates. But not that many people believe that theory. It has been unfortunately very common for crimes at sea to be blamed on false pirate attacks. Maritime security experts say it was just as likely that the men could be a treasonous crew, local fishermen in disputed waters, 
stowaways, or even thieves caught trying to steal equipment. Whatever the story behind this video, it doesn't deserve its awful contents. I don't have a video for this next case, but you'll be glad that I don't. At 2.56pm on November 4th, 2014, a gruesome post made its way onto the anonymous online forum 4chan. Now, 4chan isn't exactly known for having a wholesome community, but even this post disturbed some of its members. It read, Turns out, it's way harder to strangle someone to death than it looks in the movies with three images attached. In these pictures, a naked woman lies motionless on a bed. Her face is ghostly pale and her neck is covered in red strangulation marks. The anonymous poster replied, she fought so damn hard. Many users did not believe this poster as anyone could Photoshop images or even use old genuine crime scene pictures and claim them as their own. In his final response, the poster replied, Check the news for Port Orchard, Washington in a few hours. Her son will be home from school soon. He'll find her, then call the cops. I just wanted to share these pictures before they find me. I bought a BB gun that looks realistic enough. When they come, I'll pull it and it'll be suicide by cop. I understand the doubts. Just check the news, I have to lose my phone now. Many users didn't believe the original poster despite all of this, but some watched the news anyway, and that's when it happened. The body of 30-year-old Amber Lynn Coplin was found by her 13-year-old son when he came home from school. He saw his mother on the couch and figured she was sleeping, but he eventually became worried and called his father, who lived at a separate residence. When his father came home, he called the police. The perpetrator had gone through her purse and placed her driver's license beside her head, with the word dead scribbled across it. On a picture hung on the wall, the words, she killed me first, were written. Lastly, bad news was scribbled on the blinds. Neighbors reported having heard a violent argument the night before. The woman's boyfriend, 33-year-old David Callick, had been living with her recently, but he was gone now, and so was his car. The following night, he turned himself into police. Police in Washington are on the hunt for a man suspecting of killing his live-in girlfriend in an apartment before fleeing to Oregon. An arrest warrant was issued for David Callick, who is suspected of second-degree murder in the death of 30-year-old Amanda Lynn Coplin. Officials say Coplin's 13-year-old son told police his mother and her boyfriend argued loudly the night before a murder, but neighbors say they never heard a sound. I hear them banging, you know, closing cupboards, their washer and dryer, but I've never, ever heard fighting. Police discovered Coplin's body the next day after her son became concerned and called his father. According to a probable cause document, graphic photos posted online hours before the discovery appeared to be of the deceased woman. The person who posted the photo even commented on how the woman was killed. Just to post the pictures and what he wrote, it, it, it makes the crime a hundred times worse. Police in Portland continue to search for Calic in the victim's gold Ford Focus. Emily Roseman, The Associated Press. In 2017, he was sentenced to 82 years in state prison for the murder. But it just makes you think. There's a reason David thought 4chan was the place to post these disturbing pictures. Though some of you might not remember, I genuinely do remember watching these videos around the time that they came out. Ed Arum started posting videos of himself singing onto YouTube in its early days in 2006. In total, he posted over 130 different videos, including songs like Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman. He also posted a lot of videos of just his everyday life, including videos of his dog, his car, and his wife. But shortly after he rose to somewhat internet fame, Ed Arum's world would come crashing down. 
It soon came to light that Adarum was actually Edward Robert Muscare, born in 1932 in Queens, New York. He traveled frequently as a kid, but was voted best personality in his class of 1951 high school yearbook. In 1970, he began his entertainment career as the host of a children's program on a Kansas City television station. On the show, called 41 Treehouse Lane, he used the stage name Uncle Ed. He also worked on other projects like Uncle Ed's All Night Live and Friday Night at the Frights. Enough is enough. No more kissing. No more. <laughs> Little woman and I were saying what a wonderful evening it is to have a good movie on Friday night at the Frights. Are you ready for a good one? In 1986, however, Edward's career was over as he was arrested for the sexual battery of a 13-year-old boy. He was sentenced to 18 months in prison and then 10 years of probation. But by 2006, Edward had been married and lived in Florida. But the following year, when people on the internet, as well as his neighbors, discovered his past sexual offense charges, he moved to South Carolina. When he did so, he didn't tell local police he was a sex offender like he was supposed to because he was worried his new neighbors would find out and be angry. But strangely enough, he then appeared on a TV program in Orlando, in which he argued for sex offenders being given a second chance in society and also stated that he refused to inform local authorities about his former crime as he feared for his own safety. Upon seeing this show, South Carolina police learned that he had moved into their state and issued a warrant for his arrest. In 2009, they came to Edward's home and found his computer and alcohol, which, under South Carolina law, is illegal for anyone with previous sex offense convictions to possess. He was placed on five-year probation. Edward later claimed, quote, I would never sexually offend again, but we can't help but sin. We're all human beings. Edward then got the help of a friend to keep posting his videos for him, but this was still a breach of South Carolina law, and he was taken to court. He was then sentenced to five years in prison for probation violation, which, may I add, is much longer than his initial sex offense sentence. 2011, it was announced he was ill, and in 2012, Edward died from lung cancer in jail. He was 79 years old. It's creepy to know that anyone on the internet could be hiding a disturbing secret like this. It just goes to show that no one is quite who they say they really are. Reddit is a forum with many communities and boards designed around just about every topic you could imagine. One popular subreddit is r slash relationship advice, in which individuals ask for advice on just about any kind of relationship question you could imagine. But in 2016, an anonymous user by the name Jason and Hell posted the following, which I will read in its entirety. Too long didn't read. I caught my wife cheating on me over a year ago. I stayed with her for the sake of our children, but I haven't been able to get it off my mind since. It has been 476 days since I confronted her about it. How do I know? Because every time I catch myself thinking about it, I tell myself, it's only been X days. Maybe you won't think about it tomorrow. So to go back to the beginning, I had just taken on a new project and new responsibilities at work. I was working a lot of hours, 60 per week, and was noticeably stressed. It was in May of 2015 that I noticed she had added a password to her phone. When confronted about it, she told me it was because she was planning my Father's Day present and didn't want me to ruin the surprise. About a week later, she came to me and told me that she felt guilty keeping a big secret from me, and told me that she was having her neighbor, a contractor, build a home office for me as a present. It struck me as odd, as in our six years together, she has never said she felt guilty about anything, and always insists that she never regrets anything in her life. Time goes on, her phone is still password protected, and things don't feel right. I see her using her phone and smiling to herself more and more often, but when I ask her what she's doing, she says nothing and puts her phone away. So one morning I wait for her to get in the shower, and I grab her phone before it requires her password. I go through her messages and find that she is texting the neighbor, I'm all covered in frosting, you want to lick it off? 
There were no other messages to the neighbor, but I found out later that was because she'd set up her phone to delete messages after a certain amount of time. I felt uncomfortable with it, but I knew she had a perverted sense of humor and I thought she would never do anything to hurt me. More time goes by and the neighbor is spending more and more time at our house, but the office is being completed slower and slower. I can't help but worry that something isn't right, so I start checking her location using Google Timeline. It was at this point that I realized that there are large gaps in her GPS history because she was turning off her phone's GPS. Fast forward to July and at this point the paranoia is driving me nuts, so I tell her that I need to install new antivirus on her phone. While she has it unlocked for me, I install anti-theft software so I can remotely turn the GPS back on and set up AT&T message backup and restore, so I can read all of her text messages from that point on my computer. The next day, my mother asks to spend time with my two kids, so my wife drops them off with her and has the day to herself. I watch my wife's activity from work as she spends the day trying to meet up with a neighbor but is unsuccessful because he's busy with another job site. That night, we get the kids back from my mom's house and we go out to dinner with the neighbor, his girlfriend, and his son. My wife and his girlfriend are having a good time drinking, laughing, and just joking around. His girlfriend mentions that his girlfriend mentions that she would like to see Magic Mike XXL, and I say it's a good idea. I'll watch the kids so my wife and her can go. So my wife and her go, and the neighbor and I go back to my house so the kids can play video games together. The kids are back in my son's room playing video games, and the neighbor is sitting across from me on the couch. It is at this point that my wife starts texting him. She's describing sex acts that she would like to perform with him, and he's reciprocating. She tells him to check his Snapchat, and at the same time I get a Snapchat from her too, and it is her fingering herself in a bathroom stall. They keep talking, trying to figure out when they can meet up and have sex. They decide on Monday morning after I go to work. So in my head, I had already planned to pretend to leave and circle back to catch them, but they could tell each other that they love each other and that it is all I can do not to leap off the couch and knock him out. But I contain myself and continue reading the conversation unfolding in front of me. Then he tells her, you're my girl now, to which she replies, always have been, ending with him writing, and always will be. My wife and the neighbor's girlfriend return from the movie and I ask them politely to sit down. I then ask the kids to stay in my son's room and shut the door. I return to the living room and confront my wife and the neighbor. I say, so you two love each other, huh? My wife goes into full-blown denial mode and the neighbor's girlfriend starts smacking him. I ask my wife if she's been texting him, she says no. So I show her the text messages. She admits to it, but says it was the first time it had gone that far. I ask my wife if she had sent him pictures, she says no. So I show her the picture, and she admits, but says it was the first time. I ask her if she's having sex with him, and she says no, because I didn't wait to catch them having sex together, I don't have evidence to prove her wrong, so that one stayed unresolved. I tell her that I'm leaving her, she tells me that she will make sure I never see my kids again if I do. She planned on using the fact that I had attempted suicide in high school to prove me unfit to have the children. She continues to say that it was my fault for being so busy with work and stressed out that she just wanted someone that she could talk to. Then she gives me an ultimatum to decide what I'm going to do, or she will decide for me. The neighbor's girlfriend starts defending the two of them, saying it couldn't have been that serious if they weren't having sex and that my wife and I are too perfect to let this break up. The neighbors go home and my wife and I argue for the rest of the night about what we are going to do. We go to bed separately, having not resolved anything. We keep going back and forth on the subject all weekend and finally settle on we were going to separate temporarily while we figure out what we want. I was going to stay in the house and she was going to take the kids and go to her mom's house. That Monday, I go to work and I get a text from her in the middle of a meeting with my bosses, stating that she has explained things to our kids, but that they were upset and I need to explain it to them also. I get home from work to find my kids crying. She had told them that mommy had to move out because dad was mad at her. When my son wanted to stay with me, she told him that he can't. My son put it together that if mommy has to move out because I'm mad at her, then he must move out and I must have been mad at him too. My daughter was crying because my son was. I don't think she was old enough to understand what was happening. It was at that moment I realized she was going to drag the kids through hell if I left her. So I swallowed my feelings and begged her to stay. She agreed and insisted that I apologize to our neighbor since we were still going to need to hang out with them because our sons are good friends. 
I hate it, but I do it anyway. We still hang out with them from time to time, and they come to our various birthday and holiday parties. But I'd do anything for my kids, and I behave civil every time. Things die down for a while. I still think about it constantly. I worry how I can keep from making her so unhappy that she cheats on me again. Then, almost a year from the original incident around Father's Day, she sent him pictures again. She claims it was on accident and that she meant to send them to me instead. I don't fully believe her, but I move on anyway. Things have been quiet on that front for about four months, but I still think about it constantly. This is going to sound stupid, but I feel like I have a part of my brain that I can't shut off that is always thinking. I used to use that to solve programming problems, and it made me very good at my job, but ever since this incident, the only thing it thinks about is her and him and if I did the right thing. My job performance has suffered, and I feel like I haven't gotten sleep in months. I am afraid after this much time and the fact that I begged her back, that to say I want a divorce would only make her more vindictive toward my children and I. I just feel like I have put myself so deep in a hole that I can never get back out. I haven't really talked to anyone about this. I didn't want to talk to my mom about it because I felt like she would treat my wife differently and I don't need the two of them fighting any more than they already do. I tried talking to one friend about it, but his advice was to put my trust in God. That was not much solace for me as I am an atheist. So I have no clue what to do with my feelings or how to move on from this. Now, this post is absolutely heartbreaking. Many people responded telling Jason that he deserved better and needed to leave his wife not only for his own sake, but for the sake of his kids. Jason decided to take Reddit's advice and file for divorce. But just three days later, this call would be made to 911. What happened? I just stabbed myself and I killed my two children. You stabbed yourself and killed your two children? Mm-hmm. She says her three-year-old daughter, Charlie, and seven-year-old son, Tyler, are laying dead inside her daughter's room. And what caused you to do this today? My husband wanted to divorce and wanted to take my kids. I won't want his son my kids. Her husband, Jason Worley, filed for divorce the day before. Where's your husband at? Downstairs somewhere. Okay, it, it, what's his condition? I don't know, I haven't talked to him. Then the operator asks how Worley is feeling. She says she's really tired. I took a lot of Benadryl. You took a lot of Benadryl? Yeah. Okay. I, I gotta go. You gotta go? Yeah, I'm tired. The operator convinces her to stay on the line saying he wants to make sure she stays safe, but she assures him she's ready for what's coming. I figured I'm going to be arrested. He asks if she plans to cause any trouble when police get there, but she says no. They could come get me. I'm okay. My mom's here. You want to talk to her? Yes. The conversation continues with Worley's mother, who's absolutely hysterical after finding out what happened. The operator eventually ends the conversation with her once responders get there and start their questions. Worley's jury trial is set for April 11th. We plan to be there. Kayla Sullivan, News 18. Jason's wife, Brandy Worley, attacked her two children and then tried to take her own life. Seven-year-old Tyler and three-year-old Charlie both died from their injuries. Jason was reportedly asleep in the basement during the time of the attack. Disgustingly, Brandy had told him to sleep on an air mattress down there rather than the couch, where he might have been able to hear the attack from. Brandy was charged with two counts of murder and was sentenced to 120 years in an Indiana women's prison. People online had made connections to the similarities in Jason's story and the crime case, but eventually Jason came back onto Reddit to update those who were concerned about him. In his 2018 update, Jason spoke, If I can impart on you something I have learned through all of this, it is that you should always take the time to be with the ones you love. It doesn't matter if they are asking you to read the pokey little puppy for the millionth time or asking you to play Smash Bros, even though you both know they will wipe the floor with you every time. Just do it because you never know what time will be the last time. Always make sure they know how much you love them. I had the fortune that the last thing my children ever heard me say was, I love you, good night, I will see you in the morning. And so there are five disturbing true crime cases from around the internet. What are your thoughts on these cases? Let me know down in the comments below or suggest topics for future videos. Every like and comment helps, so thank you so much for watching and supporting my channel. Feel free to check out my TikTok for more regular content, link in the description. I'm Sam and thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.